Amazing church. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Annalise. I am so excited to be here with you this morning. Um, when dad told me that y'all were going to start studying the book of Proverbs this summer for summer school, I was so excited because as a kid, mom and dad had us read through Proverbs on a daily basis um, every month. And so I can tell you that even still as a 20-year-old, that is something that I have to cling to, a habit that was created in me from a young age. Um, so I'm really excited to just kind of dig into what the Lord has laid on my heart for today. Um, that said, over the course of the past year, I've had various situations um, and just kind of weird circumstances, just crazy things over the past year. It's been busy. Um, I just finished my sophomore year of college. Um, and this past year, I got the opportunity to serve as a resident assistant um, at my university. So basically what that means is that I, along with my ministry partner, we lived on our hall. We had 54 girls that we were responsible for. Um, stuff administrative, like making sure that their rooms were clean and making sure that they were in their room by 12 a.m., curfew, cleanliness, stuff like that. Um, but we also had the really unique experience to be able to pour into our leadership team um, and just kind of care for the spiritual well-being of our hall. So that was a crazy but really cool experience. Um, and then most of you know that last summer I spent two months in Guatemala on a Spanish immersion trip. Well, I actually got the opportunity to go back this summer as one of the leaders for that trip. Again, really unexpected things that happen, crazy circumstances, but just a really cool picture of the Lord's faithfulness. Um, so while I was there, my co-leader and I were responsible for the 14 students that were on our team, making sure that they were speaking Spanish, making sure that they were drinking water, which they got tired of hearing, um, making sure that they were where they needed to be. So just kind of stuff like that. So between RA and between Guatemala, and then just kind of random life things over the past year, I kind of find myself repeatedly asking the question, what am I supposed to do now? Whether that meant I'm sitting in a class that is really, really hard, and I start thinking, oh gosh, maybe I'm not studying the right major. What am I supposed to do now? Or maybe I'm walking back to my dorm room, and my RA partner calls me and says, Annalise, you need to come back. I hear sirens. There's something going on. Something's going wrong. Uh, what are we supposed to do now? Or maybe that meant I was sitting in Guatemala with some of my friends who got really, really sick and weren't getting any better despite my nursing techniques that I'm not trained for. Um, what are we supposed to do now? Or there's a situation that happens while we're there and we are deciding, can she stay? Can she go? Um, what are we supposed to do now? So just time and time again, I found myself asking this question, what am I supposed to do now? I don't feel prepared. I don't feel equipped. Um, what happens next? So I think the cool thing about this is the Lord very specifically tells us when we encounter circumstances like that, he gives us this piece of advice. Um, so we're going to be spending most of our time in Proverbs 1 today. So let's pray um, and then let's jump into that. Father God, we just thank you um, for this day and this place. We thank you for just the blessing that it is to be able to gather in this place, um, both in physical presence and online, um, and declare your name publicly. We know that a lot of our brothers and sisters around the globe don't have that privilege. So for those who are meeting in secrecy, for those who are meeting in silence, we just pray your blessing and your protection over them. Strengthen them. Um, would you strengthen us this morning? Open our hearts to what you have to teach us. God, would you take my words and make them yours and not mine? Um, we thank you and we praise you for who you are, all that you've done, um, and all that you've yet to do. So it's in your sweet name that we pray. Amen. Okay. So verse 5 is the verse that we're going to be spending most of our time on today, and this is what it says. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. So basically what we're going to be talking about today is wise counsel and what it looks like to seek that. And we're going to do that in three different areas, kind of. So first we're going to talk about what keeps us from wise counsel. Then we're going to talk about what brings us to wise counsel. And finally, we're going to talk about what comes out of wise counsel. Um, so I guess that's kind of a funny question, right? What keeps us from wise counsel? If the Bible is specifically telling us that that's something we're supposed to, supposed to pursue, why aren't we doing that? Why are we not seeking wise counsel when the Lord is telling us to do so as believers? Um, in other words, what's hindering us from that? And I think that there are a couple different things that keep us from pursuing wise counsel, the first of which is pride. Um, I know a couple weeks ago when Josh Baker taught, he spoke on humility and the fact that pride keeps us from wisdom. And I don't want to seem like I'm beating a dead horse here, but this could not be more true. Um, so in order to maybe make that a little clearer, I want to tell you a story. And I know that the last time Dad taught, he used a fishing story, but we have this running joke in our family that we all share a brain. 
So I'm going to talk about fishing too, but that's okay. You can just bear with me. Um, so like he said, the last or any time that we're visiting my grandpa, our feet are in the lake as soon as they tell us it's safe to fish. So the last time we were in Missouri visiting Papa, um, they told us that we could fish. We got on our waders. My oldest sister and I were in the lake. Everything was going really great. It was a beautiful day on Lake Taney Como. And then all of a sudden, after I had been casting and catching fish, I'd already quite caught quite a few, I started to throw my line out, and then something happened, and I was like, why, why is nothing happening here? And I don't know how much you know about fishing or how familiar you are with it, but fishing line is called fishing line for a reason. It's supposed to be straight, and this is what my line looks like. Shout out to Dad for keeping this. I don't know why. I mean, good job, but... <laughs> Um, I don't know if you can see this, but it is a tangled mess. It is not straight. It is not a line. It is a glob. Um, so when this happened, I was frustrated, clearly. I didn't know how in the world I did that. But being the 20-year-old independent self that I am, I did not want to ask for help at all, at all, at all. So I tried to fix it myself, couldn't. And then I begrudgingly, begrudgingly asked my dad and grandpa to help me. I have a picture of that. Okay, I don't know if... <laughs> I look so stressed, and I had to apologize for being a little feisty in this moment, but in this situation, was, along with many other situations in my life, dad and grandpa are the wise counsel, right? They're the ones who have more experience than I do. They have been fishing far longer than I have, so they know what to do, but because I let my pride get in the way, I didn't want to ask for help. And I think that in a lot of areas in life, we are afraid of looking incapable. We are afraid of looking weak or inept, maybe, and so we don't ask for help because we let pride get in the way. Um, and if it's not pride, I think it's maybe one other area that keeps us from seeking wise counsel. And I would submit to you that that is not letting people close enough to see our tangled up mess. Dare we call this vulnerability? And that's a scary word, I know, because we don't like vulnerability because it's this situation that makes us appear weak maybe, we're afraid of getting hurt if we open up to people, but in order for people to be able to know us, to see past our facade of fine, we have to let people close enough to call us on our crap, honestly. And so it's just this situation that we have to be willing to let down some walls. And I know that's a scary thing, but that is something, not wanting to let people close enough is something that keeps us from asking for wise counsel. Um, so now that we kind of understand a few of the things that keep us from seeking wise counsel, let's talk about what it looks like that brings us to that. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Um, the word in this verse used for hear is actually the Hebrew word shema, and it means to, more than just to hear. It means hearing in its effects, taking heed, being obedient, doing what is asked. So when the Lord is telling us that a wise man will hear, it means that a wise man will hear, but also be obedient to the counsel that follows. Um, so hearing, I think, entails or requires a few different things. The first of which is kind of basic. It's just an awareness of who the Lord is, right? So we need to be able to know his character. And in order to do that, we have to be willing to consume this book on a daily basis. That seems like a super basic thing. And I think we hear that over and over again be in scripture, be invested in scripture, but I know for at least me, it's really easy to be like, ah, I'm kind of tired, I'm just going to go to bed, I don't want to get up early, like, I don't really want to make time in my day for that, but if we're not invested in this book, if we're not taking heed of what the Lord is telling us, then it's going to be really hard to distinguish his voice, and a lot of times the Lord gives us wise counsel straight from scripture. It is a divinely inspired book, so we need to be invested in it. Um, so if wise counsel is coming from scripture, that's great, and it does a lot of times. But also, it comes from another area, and I would tell you that that is from people. A lot of times, what I've found in my life is that the Lord uses people as an instrument to speak his voice to me. Um, and in order to kind of understand what that looks like, we need to be putting ourselves in intentional situations where there are people around us that we can hear God's voice from. Um, in order to kind of get a better grasp on what that looks like, I think it's a really cool thing to look at the story of Samuel. And I don't know how much you know about Samuel, but for today, what I want you to understand is this. In the book of 1 Samuel, we see him twice, okay, in two different phases, kind of. 
the first of which as a young boy, and the second as an older man. So the first time that we see Samuel, his mother is actually taking him to a high priest. So his mom, who was once barren, basically told the Lord, if you give me a child, I will return the child to you for your service. So the Lord does. The Lord gives her Samuel. And so as he is a young boy, she takes him to the high priest to rededicate his life kind of to the Lord's service. Um, so in this situation, the priest, the high priest, is the one in an authority position over Samuel. And this kind of points me to understand that a lot of times wise counsel comes from authority, from the people that are in kind of positions in charge of you. Um, personally, I, over the last year, have had countless, countless people in authority positions over me that have poured in excessive amounts of wise counsel. So as an RA, every RA, the way that it works at my school, has a resident director who is in charge of around eight to 10 RAs. So my resident director, her name was Hannah, and yes, she was my boss, she was technically my authority figure, but because she spent such a great deal of time daring to be vulnerable with me and I her, there was an established relationship that when things were going wrong, or not even when things were going wrong, when it was just a normal week, she was the one calling me and checking on me to make sure that I was doing well, to make sure that if I needed anything, I was getting it, and to pour in these wise words of experience. And again, when I was in Guatemala, the directors of our trip were very similar in that they, they had experienced everything that we were experiencing before. The director of the trip who started the trip had been going to Guatemala for 20 years. So he had so much experience, so much wisdom, and because they had built this relationship of authenticity, honestly, with us, there was this capability to pour in wise counsel. So a lot of times, authority is wise counsel. And teenagers, kids, young adults, can I tell you, your parents are wise counsel. Your parents are in authority figures over you, yes, but also they have experienced a lot of what you've experienced before. And I can't tell you how many times I'm like, cannot make a decision without calling my parents from school and being like, what do I do now? So use, utilize that. That is something that the Lord has very intentionally given you. Um, so if your parents are anything like mine, they are wise counsel and it is worth a phone call or asking for help. So if authority figures, there, that's one area. The next area of wise counsel that we see is the people around us. So the second time we see Samuel, he is an older man and in 1 Samuel 7, it says this. Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he used to go annually on circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mitzvah, and he judged Israel in these places. So we have a map of Samuel. This is the kind of the journey that he was taking. So as he was going, he was basically foretelling and forthtelling who the Lord is, what he has done, and what he's going to do. So Samuel, as he's going to these places, has people around him. He has people in his circuit. So I would simply ask you, who's in your circuit? Who are your people? Who are the people that are close enough to you that they can be able to call you on your crap, that they can see close enough to see beyond your facade of, no, I'm fine, and they can be pouring into you wise counsel? I'll tell you that over the course of the past year, I've had lots of people around me, right? I had 54 girls living on my hall. I have 14 students on my Guatemala team, but between and just all of the people that were around me, I kind of found my people. The people who would do random things with me, like sit in the library for seven hours while I was procrastinating a paper, or go to the grocery store with me when I was out of milk, or share meals. Random stuff like that, in that they allow, it allows us to see each other's patterns, to notice each other's tendencies, and when things aren't going great, they are the ones who already know me, and they can be speaking wise counsel into my life. Um, so those are kind of the two areas that we see. And so I would just really encourage you to start thinking about who's in your circuit? Who are your people? I remember countless times when I was a kid, mom and dad saying, Annalise, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Who is it that you're spending your time with? Who is it that you're investing into and allowing to invest in you? Um, we can also say it this way. The relationships that you build when nothing's wrong allow for wise counsel when everything is wrong. A lot of times I think we want these really deep, profound connections with people, but we're not willing to be patient, to till the soil of friendship, and get close enough and sort through the tangled up mess of other people's lives. And that's a really, really essential part of the life of a believer. 
Um, so now that we've kind of looked at what keeps us from wise counsel, what brings us to wise counsel, um, it's important to look at what comes out of it. And right here, for the most part, we can kind of just let the Bible speak for itself. So it's very specific about wise counsel. Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. Listen to counsel and accept discipline that you may be wise the rest of your days. He whose ear listens to the life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. For by wise guidance you will wage war, and in an abundance of counselors there is victory. So the Lord is very, very specific and over and over and over again is telling us, seek wise counsel. Surround yourselves with an abundance of counselors um, because that is where victory comes from. So I think that today you probably find yourself in one of the three following categories, I would imagine. Maybe you're sitting here and you're like, life is going really well. My fishing line is straight. I'm not in any messes. I don't really need help, so I don't really need to be thinking about this at all. Could I encourage you to preemptively make the decision that when you do find yourself in a tangled up mess, because it will happen inevitably, you already have decided to listen and obey, to hear what the Lord is telling you through his word or through his people, and to already have made the choice to listen to that wise counsel. Um, maybe you're sitting here today and you very much need wise counsel. You desperately, desperately need help. Um, could I encourage you to swallow your pride to embrace vulnerability, and to ask for help. Maybe it's an, someone that's in an authority position over you. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it is a pastor, a counselor. But maybe it's also your people. Who have you built relationships with that you can ask for help? Who knows you well enough to say, you're really not okay, and who can pour into your life? And if you're in neither one of those places, maybe you have already asked for wise counsel from someone, and you've gotten feedback, you've gotten advice, you've gotten counsel, can I encourage you to just receive it? The Lord has given us his word and his voice through other people, not simply for information, but for transformation. Don't just sit on the wise counsel that someone has given you and just not do anything about it. It requires action and it requires intentionality. Ultimately, I think if we are wanting to give and receive wise counsel, there has to be this kind of basic understanding that we need to be present where we are. I know last year that I spent a great deal of time talking to you about what it looked like to be here now, um, and I said that over and over and over again. Well, in order to be receiving wise counsel, to be giving wise counsel, you have to be invested in the place that you're at. I know as a college kid, being having my life occur in so many different places is kind of hard, and so when I'm home, I'm thinking about going back to school and all of the things that I have to do and applying for a job and all of these things, classes, buying books, yada, yada, yada. When I am at school, I'm thinking about wanting to be home. I'm thinking about my people here whose lives are going on while I'm not here. When I'm in Guatemala, I'm thinking about home too. So it's really easy, I think, to get so caught up in things that are going, around, going on elsewhere that I miss out on what's happening right in front of me. So I would just encourage you to be very, very diligent about being where your feet are planted. If you are at school, be at school. If you are at home, be fully there. If you are at work, be fully there. Um, it just comes down to, I think, making the decision to be intentional about the time that you get with the people that are around you. So be where you are. Um, secondly, I think we have to be willing to till the soil of friendship. We have to dare to know and be known. Invest in the people that are around you. Take time to sit through the silences. Take time to see, people's, see through people's facades of fine um, and just kind of get into the tangled up mess. Ultimately, friends, we have to be willing to swallow our pride. We have to be willing to embrace vulnerability and we have to be willing to ask for wise counsel. Uh, as the band goes ahead and comes up, uh, you're in one of three categories today. I think Annalise is right. Life with God's never been better. Things are good. Um, no problems, no crises, just nothing. If you find yourself there today, are you intentional 
in this moment of cultivating relationships. First of all, cultivating the relationship with God where you go to his word, not out of obligation, but out of joy, because you know that that book is not just a textbook, but it is the very bread of life itself where God is going to speak and it's going to offer you life and you're developing that relationship with God. Are you being intentional in those moments when everything's fine about, about doing the hard work of developing relationships with your people? Uh, people who can see past your facade of fun. Because as Annalise said, the, the relationships we build when everything's fine are going to be the ones we rely on when everything's wrong. So many people, I watch people in the midst of crisis and they have nobody around them and they don't know where to turn and they don't know who to call. Maybe you're here today and everything's fine. Well, if that's you, I encourage you, use this season of your life to build a relationship with God. And to build a relationship with other people. Maybe you say, I don't know what a relationship with God looks like. Well, it begins with this, that God loves you and wants a relationship with you. He created you so that he could have you as his very own. He loves you. For God so loved the world. You go back to the very beginning of the scriptures that in the garden that God created men and women, the culminating act of his creation so that he could walk with them and talk with them and spend eternity with them. But you and I have a problem and it's called sin. And sin separates us from God and we can't have this relationship with God because he's holy and we're not. Because he's perfect and we're not. And so we have a problem and it's called sin. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. God has a provision for your sin and my sin. And when we understand that sin is anything that we do that doesn't please God, anything that we think that doesn't please God, anything that we say that doesn't please God, anything that we should have done which would have pleased God but we left it undone, that's Scripture's definition of sin, and we can agree for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. But God has a provision. He says, uh, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died. And the scriptures say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That God will deal with your sin problem. Jesus became your substitute sufferer and mine on a cross. He lived a life of perfection, died a death on a cross, and rose from the dead so that you and I can have a relationship with God. But it's your choice. Have you begun a relationship with God today? If not, it's as simple and as hard as swallowing your pride and saying, God, I need you. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Maybe you prayed a prayer like that and you've just kind of coasted and you're not intentionally developing that relationship with God through how he's spoken to you in his word. But you're in that season and everything's fine. Uh, you're in a season and this is your life. Um, Annalise and I were talking, one of the joys of uh, the summer series is getting to work with all the teachers and you'll, you'll forgive this dad if he has a teacher's pet of the teachers this summer, won't you, just a, just a little bit. Um, she was talking and we were talking about what she wanted to do and she said, this is what I want to do and she was talking about that moment on the, on the lake. And I'm like, hold on just a minute. I got up from the t kitchen table, walked back into my office and walked out. And I handed her this. This is the actual fishing line from that day. Um, and I had taken it on the lake and I just put it in my pocket and kept it because I knew at some point in time it would be a great illustration about all of us. I didn't know that my daughter was going to want to use it. It's a bird's nest. It's a, it's a mess. And you can try to fix it on your own or you can ask for help. And there are people around you uh, that ask for help. And this is one of those hard things to admit in front of your child. But as they grow, they've figured it out anyway. So it's just better to confess it to them anyway. Um, the only reason I could help with this fishing line is because I've been tangled up way more times than she has been. I've made a mess of my fishing line a lot more than she ever has. And it's the same with life. I've been in a lot of messes. And the role God's given me is not a role of judgment in her life or in the lives of those of you who are part of Miami Valley Church to, to be your judge and juror is to be somebody that says, hey, I've had that mess too and here's how I found God's grace and here, here's how I found his forgiveness and here's how sometimes he just cut my line, re-threaded my pole and, and we started over again. Maybe you're in the middle of a crisis, swallow your pride. And if you're part of Miami Valley Community Church, our pastoral staff would love to walk with you. No judgment, no no arrogance, because we, we all know we've, we've made a whole bunch of messes, probably more than you have. And God's just been gracious to us, and we want to be gracious to you. Don't hesitate to ask for help. Every week at the end of the gathering, in the back of that, uh, downstairs in that back room, right through those two doors, there are people ready to pray with you. Not to judge you, but to pray with you and say, hey, we get it. Let us help. If you need to pray with somebody today at the end of this gathering, there'll be somebody in the back that would love to talk with you and pray with you. Maybe today... 
um, you've received wise counsel in the past, but you haven't started obeying it to hear. Wise man will hear. It's not just information, but it's transformation. Here's what I want to ask you to do. With the card that you've already filled out in your hand, on the back it says, the wise decision I need to make today is. As the band plays, as it's just a moment for you and God, would you make that decision in obedience? Tell us, and we want to walk with you this week and help you take that next step. So you and God, spend some time together, just a few minutes right now, as the band plays. Father, each and every one that's heard today with their ears now faces a choice, and it's a choice of wisdom. So whether they're in this room or they're watching online behind some mobile device, God, I pray that before uh, they get up and go about the rest of their day and their activities, that they would be not just hearers of the word, but doers. Father, for the one today that everything's great. The relationship with you has never been better. May they be intentional about developing that relationship now because in a time of crisis, they're going to need to hear your voice and need to know where to turn in your word to find counsel. God, in this season where everything's good, may they be intentional about choosing some people that will be their people. And may they build relationships when nothing's wrong so that when everything goes wrong, they can just simply rely and trust those they've invited into their lives. Father, for the one right now that they would just look at life and say, yep, that fishing line, that's me. It's just a tangled mess. And they don't know any way out. And yet they haven't asked for help. God, may they swallow their pride and they, they come with vulnerability and say, I know that if I do this, it'll, there's a risk I might get hurt. And God, would you help those of us that you've put in their paths to offer counsel that we're walking with people to never be judge or juror, but to simply be friend. To say, this is what I think God might be doing. To pray, to walk, comfort, counsel. God, you've spoken, and now we're in that third place. But through your word, through your servants, you have said, hey, the wise decision you need to make today is this back of your card. It says, this is the wise decision I need to make today. Would you fill it out? Would you put it in the red bowl as you leave? Norma's in the back, so we'd love to pray with you. May I remind those of you in the balcony to please not exit through the middle door to exit outside this side door, because that leads right down to our prayer room. There'll be some people down there praying. Would you please, would you please make the wise choice this day? If you'd like to know Jesus as your Savior, we'd love to introduce him to you. We'd love to talk to you about that. Too. Whatever the wise decision, God, thank you for what you've done in this place, this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, before we dismiss, uh, just one other thing I want to uh, talk with you about. Uh, two things, actually. Uh, Chris Carpenter, who preached last week, who talked to us about the providence of God, has also been leading uh, our Share Jesus Without Fear uh, seminars. If you attended the Saturday One Day Share Jesus Without Fear seminar, uh, see Chris as you leave at the Connect desk. Uh, the resources that uh, we ordered that didn't make it in by the seminar are in, including the, the Bible that you can use to share Jesus without fear. Uh, see Chris. He'll make sure that you got that. Again, if you attended the Saturday seminar and you are here today, please stop by and pick that up. See Chris at the Connect desk just through those doors and uh, across from the coffee. Uh, lastly, uh, I need you who call Miami Valley Church your church home uh, to pray like you've never prayed before about next weekend's event. We've been advertising uh, this Share Jesus with uh, this uh, Food Truck Sunday, August 13th. Invite, 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 invite. Um, Chris talked to us about the providence of God last week, and there are no coincidences. And so uh, last week, uh, in the course of 30 minutes, no joke, in the course of 30 minutes, we had two food trucks call us and say, we're backing out. 
uh, for events uh, beyond our control. Within another hour, a third truck called us and said, I hate to tell you this, I just realized I let my license lapse, so I can't be part of your event. So within the course of about 90 minutes, we lost three food trucks. Now, rest easy, we replaced them. So, so just rest easy. But friends, it's not about food trucks. It's about the reality that this is the first outreach event, invite event, where we have had a group of people, many of the people that have gone through the Share Jesus Without Fear seminar, who have said, we will be in that parking lot ready to have spiritual conversation. As God opens the opportunity, we will be ready to have spiritual conversation. When you have a bunch of people who are ready to show up and share Jesus, now, please rest easy. We're not going to embarrass your friends, but as God opens up that door, we've got people that are ready. And the enemy knows we've got people that are ready. Yes, the scriptures say we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We have an enemy that wants to make next Sunday all about food, physical food, but it's about spiritual food. So if you are part of Miami Valley, uh, I need you praying today and the rest of the week for what's going to take place because we've got an enemy that's fighting. Uh, so would you pray with me? God, we thank you. Uh, for the opportunity that we have every Sunday to come to this place and speak the truth of uh, Jesus boldly and without hesitation. And God, we thank you next week that we're going to have a great weekend with uh, food trucks and friends that show up. And God, we know that there's opposition to that event taking place smoothly. And we know that there will be people here ready to share Jesus. And so God, uh, we just pray uh, for Everything that takes place on this property next week, everything that takes place in this building, may Jesus be uh, lifted up. May we make much of him. God, as people step onto this property, uh, we pray over it, your provision and your protection. God, that you give those who are ready to share Jesus just wisdom and when to have a conversation and how far to take that conversation. God, we just know that next week you want to do things in people's lives and we want to be ready. So God, we pray for your provision and your protection. And God, that just next week wouldn't just be about physical food, but that somebody would taste for the very first time the bread of life and drink from the water that never, they will never thirst again. Father, we trust you for that next week. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said together, amen. Um, should Jesus not come back before next Sunday? We want you here. Invite a friend. There will be opportunities. Um, we are so excited uh, to share Jesus next weekend. Friends, here's what we believe at Miami Valley Church. Everybody spends eternity somewhere. Everybody spends eternity somewhere. And we want you and your friends to spend eternity with Jesus. Would you stand with me for a word of blessing as we go out? Again, Norma's in the back. She'd love to pray with you. There'll be folks down front. We'd love to talk and pray with you to help you take your next wise step. Friends, as you go from this place, as you get up behind your, from behind your mobile device, wherever you might find yourself in this moment, may you take the next wise step. And as you take the wise step of obedience towards Jesus, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God loves you. I love you. Should Jesus not come back before then, we'll see you next week.